abundance is uh, a lot of something. So I had to look that up. I wanted to make sure I got this right. <clears throat> so that's a theme. Uh, we have to figure out a sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So 297 billion, that's a lot of money. That's how much money is being spent on advertising every year. For context, <laughs> McDonald's made 23 billion last year. It's like 10 times the amount of money that McDonald's made last year is being spent on advertising. So if there ever was such a thing as abundance, it's advertising. And because of this being creative, I wanted to focus on the creative. So we go to the next one. You guys have all seen pictures like this, uh, this Times Square in New York. I mean, there's tons and tons of ads. So like, what makes a good one? What makes a bad one? If you go to the next slide. We also have these screens that are completely full of ads almost all the time now. So certainly this fits the criteria of abundance. And so um, I wanted to talk about ad creative because I really do think if there ever was such a thing in advertising as a silver bullet, it's advertising, it's creative. By the way, if anyone's got questions as we go along, just like, there's a small group. We can all figure this out. So just fire questions. To give you an outline for anyone who likes an agenda, <laughs> like I do. So I want to start with your input. Uh, then we'll get into some ad uh, potential, talk about bad creative. I have four ideas for you, and then we can have Q&A at the end. But really, we can just talk as we're going through this. So um, if you want to go to the next one. One of my favorites is Love and Hate from Radio Rahim back in the day to do the right thing. So let's start with this. If this is like the best 20 minutes you spend, and or this is the worst 20 minutes you spend, give me some ideas like what that looks like for you. What do you, what would you hate to walk away from this feeling like, or what would you love to walk away from this feeling like? What do you want to get out of this? I'd like to feel inspired. All right. <laughs> Let me know how I do on that one. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Okay, great. Perfect. Anyone else? <clears throat> no, I wish conversations like this, like something. To do list, at least two or three points, to do list for the next three weeks. All right. Inspiration is great, but then you just do something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Matt? I love the fact that it's great to figure out a couple years. So I'll send you this, well, Steve, maybe you can send the deck out after this, because there are hyperlinks and stuff in here to all the different sources, so you guys can have that. Um, and a whole, let me know at the end if you feel any, inspi any more inspired, or even, <laughs> even a tiny little bit more, hopefully. Uh, and so the, there is a checklist at the end, but if not that, and you want something else, let me know. Anyone over here? I was just going to say concrete. Okay. All right, educated, informed, inspired, checklist, some reading material. Knowledge without action plan is just Sure. Okay, try and fit all that in. Let me know how I do. And if I'm kind of straying off course, just let me know. Uh, so let's go on to the next thing. So let's, this is another bit of feedback. What do you think has the biggest impact on advertising profitability? And go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Uh, there's a guy named Paul Dyson that asked this question. I actually had an interview with him to ask him about this and his study and his research. Super smart guy, wicked smart. He's an econometrician. He, was, he worked at Kantar when he originally published this result. Um, and so, and he runs his own company on, uh, called Accelero, which is a marketing performance effectiveness uh, company. So they looked at a whole bunch of t different things. Just shout out whatever looks like, pick one. What do you think is the most important for advertising effectiveness? So you turn it on, it has to be way up there, man. Actually, you have to get into Yeah. Anyone else? Differing opinion? Sorry, which one? Research. Like customer insights? Sure. Okay. Uh, anyone else? A different opinion? I'd say creative quality has to be a big part of it. I mean, you're putting something that's bad out there. <clears throat> yeah. Take yeah. So if you go to the next slide, this is what they surveyed 700 marketers and they asked them the same questions, and this is how they ranked them. Multimedia, 66%. Brand versus performance, 62 I mean, you can read that. Target audience is third on the list. Um, they didn't have research in there, but I could probably say target audience would be maybe something to do with research. Yeah, yeah right? 
So then Paul took this same uh, question and he applied it to actual performance of companies and they're creative. Yeah, Matt. Sorry, I just like, what is no. Brand versus performance in the end? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's essentially that. Okay. So like, generally speaking, it's, you think of performance as being things like, what gets you the biggest ROI? Like a search campaign on Black Friday is gonna get you giant ROI. And like, so you do more of that right? and less of the brand stuff. Okay, so this isn't brand like, this is like, uh, brand is the best one. This is like picking the right kind. Yeah, it, yeah, it's the balance and the split between those two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what actually happened? So he went and looked at all the results from a whole bunch of different companies and measured through economic. I always struggle with this word. He's an econometrician, so through an econometric modeling process to figure out what outcomes actually correlated to the inputs. So you go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, right. Brand size number one. So the bigger a company is, the more they profit. Not rocket science, but hard to like, if you're a small company, just don't turn on the lights one day and all of a sudden you're a giant company. So that's like not really something you can manage today. It's things you do today that will eventually get you there. But creative quality is number two. Uh, target audience, last, <laughs> shocking, right? In my mind, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> this next one, and if you, oh, this is a bit, a bit awkward, just the formatting, but creative quality number 12, if you took budget setting three, three, four, five, and six, and you add them up, creative quality is more impactful than the, top, the next four combined. So actually, if you go to the next slide, I think this is the what the fuck slide. So <laughs> I was like, what the fuck is that all about? Why is this happening? Like, how did we get it so wrong? Like, we thought what was the first one again? Multimedia was number one, target audience was number two. And all of a sudden we find out uh, that's not true at all. So it kind of was like this wrench in my brain just going, what's happening here? Why is this happening? So if you go to the next slide, it's partly because we do stupid shit like this. <laughs> so the flipping style hairdresser, even if you can't use it, it's fun to have. <laughs> I don't know that's the best. <laughs> use of time for anybody, right? So we do stuff like that. And then if you go to the next one, we also do stuff like this. This is a huge campaign. And if you go to the next slide, that uh, won a whole bunch of awards for Burger King. Do you guys, do you guys see this one, the Moldy Whopper? I think so, yeah, yeah. Right, so I think their take on it was like, the Whopper is like real food, and then they did a time-lapse video of it, and it would, it would show day by day of the time-lapse, and it got moldier and moldier and looks disgusting. Won four Grand Prix uh, in Cannes, like it's the big, like the Oscars of, of advertising. Yeah. Which, great, you win an award, but if you go to the next one, their sales are shit. So it doesn't really matter. And so we're kind of like, what? Like we're rewarding people for creative that doesn't produce a result. <clears throat> so creative is fine and it's good. It can be super powerful, but we're like, I think there's a lot of room for us to improve. So if we go to the next one, uh, and conversely, there's this, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. There's a cool movie called Add and Copy, I think. Um, it's a few years old. And there's a guy in there named George Lois who, is one of the original Mad Men. I think they kind of designed John Draper's character, Don Draper's character after him. So Tommy Hilfiger, when he was like 25, comes to this guy, George Lois, and he's like, hey, um, I, you know, I, I got a little bit of money, not a lot of time, uh, what can you do for me? And he's like, well, if you want, you want me to make an impact, like you want to be famous tomorrow? Or do you want to like just slow play this and just like maybe see what happens? He's like, well, I wanna have like uh, models on a beach and show off my clothing and all this kind of stuff. He's like, okay, well, look at these companies that are all doing it. So if you wanna just like, if you've got 20 years and millions and millions of dollars, 
We can do that. Or we can do something like this, and I'll make you famous tomorrow. He's like, but then it's on you to deliver. <laughs> so this is the billboard he put up. Nobody knew who Tom Hilfiger was. At the time, it's Ralph Lauren, Perry Ellis, Calvin Klein, and then Tommy Hilfiger. They put this in Times Square. They actually faced this billboard right at, I think it was the Calvin Klein head office. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, just exploded. They supported this billboard with other sub, like material as well, but this was the campaign. So for a couple hundred grand at the time, it was like 1985. Um, massive impact in Tommy Hilfiger is where it is today because of this. So it takes a bit of guts to do something like this. It takes a lot of insight to like distill down a simple, a, a strategy into a simple idea to produce a result like this, but it did produce a result. And I think for me, I kept thinking about this ad and going, why isn't there more stuff like this and, and less of the other kind of thing that we get? So we go to the next one. So I have four different ideas for you. So hopefully this is part of the list. Go to the next slide. So for the first one, give Brees a chance. <clears throat> so uh, I'm just kind of, I feel like I got to move around. Um, so there's a document that we all use in marketing, a lot of people use, whether it's formally done or not. Somehow we take an idea and we translate it to somebody who's gonna pr produce something. So if you go to the next slide, there's a, there are a couple of guys that did some research on this and they went throughout the world, um, it was mainly three countries, I think Australia, the UK, and then U um, the United States, uh, were the largest areas where they pulled this from. But anyway, they got 1,700 people that they were involved in this study. So you go to the next one. So they asked marketers, like, are you good at writing a brief? So this is the thing, like, you have an idea, I'm gonna get somebody to make something, like Jason and, and Steven get these all the time. From, it's a way to translate your concept into, into starting an action so you can produce something. It's like a blueprint. 80% of marketers thought, yeah, I'm fucking really good at writing briefs. Like, really good. I'm, I'm awesome. So then they went and they, they go, okay, agencies, when you receive these briefs, do you agree with the marketers? And if you go to the next slide, only 10%. <laughs> so there's a pretty big gap, right, in people, how people think that they perform in terms of writing stuff and actually how they are writing stuff. So through this uh, research that these guys did, they found out, if you go to the next one, there's some things that are missing. like. If you ever watched, um, and Matt, you've probably heard me talking about Mark Ritson, but he's super entertaining, super awesome guy to listen to. But basically his take on this is there's, briefs are completely devoid of any fucking strategy. That's his point. <laughs> uh, he swears more than I do. Um, <clears throat> but that's what we're missing in a lot of times in these briefs, is a clear objective, clear outcome, clear strategy, clarity in general, like any clarity. <laughs> Things like, oh, we would like to be number one and top ranked in the market and considered to be uh, by everyone a loved brand. And like, that's not clear. That's not, that's not the clarity people are looking for. <clears throat> Let's go to the next slide. There are often things like this. I wanna have a brand driven uh, storytelling uh, for millennials that's authentic and purposeless. It's like, it's really just a lot of garbage. There's nothing of substance there. <laughs> So that's the first point. The second point is make a choice. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next one, what do I mean by that? This to me, if you guys ever, there's a, a Matt, this, this one would be for you. This is a paper, like an academic research paper. It's unbelievable. If you've ever heard of category entry points, um, another way to think of it is there's a trigger that makes people think of buying anything. Sometimes you go, like, I'm going through the checkout line at the grocery store, and I'm like, oh, chocolate, and then you just start, like, touch trigger, and then purchase. Sometimes it's a lot longer than that. But all these things are kind of category entry points for Coke and Pepsi. This is like the competitive landscape that Coke and Pepsi in this sample subset are looking at, and they're competing for. Each one of them is important. Each one of them is not necessarily the same value today in the, in the middle of winter as it would be in this middle of summer. 
So you gotta think about these category entry points like market share. They have a market share and they may change over time. So if you're competing for these things, that's a really important thing. You can choose which one to compete for at which time. If you go to the next slide. So often we don't make the choice and we end up with messaging like this, which is like just a whole bunch of everything. So that's the lack of clarity, lack of focus that we have a lot of times. Try and say everything and end up saying nothing. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, there's a guy named Dan White that I've done some work with and collaborating on. He's awesome, does, uh, for you guys maybe, uh, he's got a great book called Smart Marketing. Super awesome, it's like takes all these creative ideas or uh, all these marketing concepts and distills it into pictures like this and like a single page and you can just flip through and it's awesome, it's a great book. So he makes diagrams like this. This is based off of another study though, but basically what it's saying is, the more messages you try and put in an ad, the less people remember it. So if we don't make a choice on what we're gonna say, someone else will, and they may not remember the things you want them to remember. Let's go to the next one. So like Jack Pounce, it's just one thing. <laughs> There's one thing and just think about one thing and the focus will help you get better creative. Uh, the other one is that uh, my mom used to teach ESL, so English is a second language, so I kind of just spun off of that. But there is definitely a language barrier between business executives and what they would call the coloring department. So we have to find ways to bridge the gap. So if you go to the next slide, this is a quick story that I had. Uh, we presented some creative, this is back in the day when I was working at uh, FGL. So we presented this idea and they're like, uh, to the executives, I'm not so sure. And then the one guy is like, you know what, I'm gonna call my daughter, so this is the next slide. And he's like, hey, uh, what do you think of this idea? And she's like, I don't like it. And so he killed it. He killed the idea because his 16 year old daughter <laughs> didn't like the idea. And we're like, what? <laughs> like we spent, we did all the research, we did all the work, we did all, like all this collaboration, working with the agency, we spent like lots of company money on this idea. And he calls his 16 year old daughter and is like, nope. I'm like, so then we have to go back to the drawing board. So when we're talking about creative ideas, I think it's helpful to have a common language. So for creatives especially, teach people how to evaluate creative. And so this is another Dan White uh, diagram. I've used this, it's awesome. Because then it gives you a framework for evaluating creative. It's become something that's um, super subjective and something that's more objective and more specific. And so rather than saying, what do you think on this piece of creative, you can say, tell me what you think about how it resonates with you emotionally. And then does it check the box? Tell me what you think about where's the role for the brand? Could it be improved or not? Tell me what you think about the relevant associations, like the mental associations between what we're trying to say, like in that Coke diagram, which are the ones that we're trying to target? So using something like this is a really helpful tool to teach people how to evaluate the thing you're putting in front of them. Next one. And hopefully you can avoid stuff like this where people are just going, yeah, yeah, let's pick the really creative idea and we'll just end up doing the same thing we always do. And then the last point that I just wanna make is that remember that we forget. So uh, if you go to the next slide. Our natural state of memory is to decay. Like I forget birthdays of people that I should never forget birthdays on. And it's not because I'm a jerk, I just can't remember. Even if I put a little arms in my calendar to remind me, it like I felt like a dirt bag, trust me, when it's like somebody that I really care about and I don't remember, but it's just the way memory works. Like the longer you get from a point in time, the less and less accurate the memory is, right? So the next one is, uh, you can combat that by like repeating messaging, repeating the way you're saying it, repeating the style in which you're saying it. So, and people learn different ways. We talk about customer research. Um, not everybody learns the same way. So you can put a blog up, that's fine. Great for people who love to read. But if you do an infographic, that's another way of, and it could be the same thing, but it's another way to teach people the same thing because there's people that are learning different ways. 
And there's also this thing where like, we get bored, creatives uh, and marketing people, we get bored of the thing we put in market, but for the most part, if you go to the next one, just people don't think you're a big deal. Like we think we're a big deal. <clears throat> like ask me, I think I'm a like, huge deal. <laughs> but, but that's not what everyone else thinks. And so rather than a brand starting from a point of, oh no, everyone's heard of us, start from nobody knows who we are. Like even if we've been in the market for 20 years, there's still 16, 17, 18 year olds that have never heard of you. And they're gonna be in market tomorrow. So it's as important to be mindful of this as, as anything else. So just a couple of takeaways for you guys. Uh, creative is, I literally think it's the biggest profit driver that we have uh, for driving business results. Uh, briefs are probably the most important document that the marketing department has. Uh, making a choice about your message is really, really like a big thing. Um, especially that's where you put it in the brief. Like I'm gonna do this and we're not gonna say this. Like even writing a do and do not list. And then the last one is uh, creative as, <laughs> as a second language. Teach people how to speak. Like give them the tools to help them give you better feedback. And I think that's it. Any questions? <laughs>